All right, ladies and gentlemen. Hey, so class recording has started. On Friday, we continued our discussion of covalent bonding. And we talked first, reviewing covalent bonding, and we said that covalent bonding and ionic bonding are similar. In what way? I guess so you can go a couple of different ways. Buddy, what's one way? Valence electrons. Specifically, how many valence electrons are we looking for? Eight. Eight. Because that relates to what? Lower energy state, stable configuration, all those would work, all right? So that's why atoms bond, whether it's ionically or covalently. But we said the big difference being, right, how they work it. That ionic bonds get to that eight valence electron by transferring or in ionic bonding, electrons are transferred between a metal and a non-metal. But in covalent bonding, we're sharing electrons between two non-metals. Then on Friday, we introduced this big long word, electronegativity. Describe to me electronegativity in your own words. Don't just read me back the definition from your outline. What is electronegativity or what does electronegativity describe for us? The ability to attract electrons. Read it or else. How likely you are to attract electrons. Somebody, those are all, those are all electrons. So. Those are all good, by the way. Somebody this morning used this and uh, somebody else, and I thought this was good as far as keeping up with like making it more real, the ability to hog electrons, all right? That's what electronegativity tells us. We said this table here takes all the factors that could contribute to your ability to hog electrons. Um, I will give you not necessarily this chart, but anything on the test that you require electronegativities for, I will give you those values. So you don't have to memorize any of this or find them anywhere. Like I'll say, hey, there's a bond between carbon and oxygen. Carbon has a 2.5, oxygen has a 3.5, right? So, hey. So, these factors that contribute to an, an atom's ability to hog electrons are summarized by this scale. Four being the highest value, right? Fluorine has the highest value, it's the highest, most electronegative atom. And then over here on the left-hand side, right, lower values because these atoms don't want to gain electrons, they don't attract electrons, they're trying to get rid of them. We talked about that on the noble gases, group 18, right? So we don't have electronegativity values because in most cases they don't attract electrons at all, but there are some exceptions. Not that xenon is out there forming compounds with stuff, but under the right circumstances, it can attract electrons. Good there. While electronegativity describes an individual atom's ability to hog electrons, bonds exist between two atoms. So when we are talking about how electronegativity affects a bond, we can't just look at the electronegativity value of one single atom. We have to compare it to another atom. Did we get this far on Friday? Yeah. Okay. We basically just wrote these down, yes? Oh, we didn't get this far? Okay. So let's talk about this. When we are... Yeah, I'll make it big. Yeah. All right. So when we are talking about bonding... Oops. When we are talking about bonding... Like I said, you cannot just look at the electronegativity value of an individual atom. You have to look at the difference between the two atoms. And hence, difference between electronegativity values is bold and underlined and italicized. Okay? We need to compare the values. Right? There are three boundaries that we look for. And if you look on your outline, I think starting at Roman numeral number five, letter A, okay? So if we have 
sorry, Roman numeral five, little letter A. Yes? Yeah. yeah. Roman numeral five, letter C, lowercase letter A, down at the bottom of page two. Okay? If we have a difference in electronegativity values greater than 1.7, we classify that as an ionic bond. If the values are very, very different, one has a very high electronegativity, the other one has, sorry, write this down, then we'll talk, okay? So on the back side, uh, little letter B and little letter C, if the difference between, if the difference between them is zero and 0 0.4, we classify that bond as non-polar covalent. And our little description of that situation is our electrons are shared equally. And then, if we're between 0 0.4 and 1.7, we classify that as polar covalent. And we'll spend most of our time today talking about polar covalent bonds. All right, good here. Got this stuff written down? Okay, so let's talk about the analogy that we could use to describe these three different types of bonds, okay? So first, let's say, and we'll use this as our analogy, right? Let's say uh, you have a little brother. If you don't have a little brother, pretend you do, okay? And let's say that for Christmas, your parents buy you and your little brother an Xbox One, okay? These three different cutoffs and these three different levels of bonding would describe three ways in which the Xbox One can be used, okay? Let's start with the middle one, because that's the nicest one, right? So, if we have electronegativity differences between zero and 0 0.4, that means that those atoms have a similar desire to hog electrons, yes? Okay? Even if we're talking about a situation where we have two fluorine atoms bonded together, okay? Fluorine has the highest electronegativity of any atom on the periodic table. But if it's bonded to another fluorine, even though each individual fluorine wants to grab electrons, one doesn't want electrons more than the other one. The difference in electronegativity values then would be what? Zero. And even though each fluorine wants electrons, neither one of them grabs more than the other. They share nice and evenly. Right? The top one if the difference between them is 1.7 or greater. One atom hogs electrons way more than the other atom. So much so that there is no sharing. The one completely hogs the electron away from the other one. It belongs to that one, the higher electronegativity, sorry, the electron belongs to the atom with the higher electronegativity and the one with the lower electronegativity doesn't have that electron anymore. Okay? That's what we talked about in ionic bonding, right? There's no sharing. There is a complete transfer of one to the other. But the one at the bottom. We're sharing, but we're not playing nice. Okay? Going back to our Xbox One Example, right? The middle, nonpolar covalent, right? You and your little brother play Xbox One together all the time. Your Xbox One is located in the family room where you both can use it 
just as much as the other one. You play together all the time. Everybody's happy. Right? Good there? Okay. Top. Ionic bonding. The day after Christmas, or maybe Christmas afternoon, right? The Xbox One moves to your room. It's hooked up to your TV in your room. Your room remains locked at all times. Your little brother is not allowed in there under any circumstances. And hence, your little brother never gets to play the Xbox One that your parents bought for both of you. Right? We're not sharing anymore, people. You've completely stolen the Xbox One from your brother. Right? Okay? That's an ionic bond. But the one on the bottom, right? That's the one that gets a little bit complicated. Okay? The Xbox One is in your room. However, your little brother can come in to play Xbox One in your room under the following conditions. One, you must be there. Two, no longer than 15 minutes at a time. Three, he may not log in on your login under any circumstances whatsoever. Are you sharing the Xbox One? Yes. Technically, yes. Are we sharing evenly? No. Oh, yeah, I forgot. He can't save any progress on any game that he makes either, all right? So, all right? So, are you sharing? Yeah. Are you sharing evenly? Not exactly, all right? So there's our analogy. Let's talk about what that then means, okay? So, in a nonpolar covalent bond, I'm sorry if that hit a little too close to home for anybody, okay? Like that, you know, so I'm just... Like saying, I'm sorry if that hit too close to home, but maybe that will help you remember polar covalent bonds. Because you know what? You're not going to be playing Xbox One at home very much, so you can study polar covalent bonds. Right? You know, so. All right. So some atoms have a similar attraction for electrons. So when they are sharing electrons with other atoms, there is a nice and even distribution. Okay? When we say some atoms have a similar attraction for electrons, we might also state what? That some atoms have a similar what? Electronegativity. And that results, here you see here, there are no positive or negative sides. That will make a little bit more sense here in just a second. Yeah? Look good there? Okay. But then, for a polar covalent, sorry, sure. But then, go ahead. Oh. This is referred to as nonpolar covalent bond. Is that what the is that what the last line is? These electrons will be shared evenly. How's that? It's all extra negative. What? Um, no, because it's not the electrons that are the nonpolar covalent bond, but those electrons I I, I intended that those electrons will be shared evenly. That's really what I wanted. Sorry, apparently I need to revamp this one because you'll see the next one. There's like in the next outline, there's things too that you're like, what am I supposed to write here? So sorry. Good there. Yes. So let's now talk about polar bonds. Okay. Some atoms have a greater attraction for electrons than other atoms. We could say that they have a greater what? Electronegativity. And when these atoms form covalent bonds, electrons will not be shared evenly. 
And when that's the case, we refer to this as a polar covalent bond. All right, got this written down? Let's talk about this picture down at the bottom of that page because that picture explains quite a bit about a polar covalent bond. All right. You have a description next to that picture, but you might want to add a little bit onto your own as far as you know, maybe explaining it a little bit better and stuff like that. So here is a picture of a molecule between hydrogen and chlorine. Hydrogen and chlorine are both non-metals. So they are forming a covalent bond. However, if you look at their electronegativity values, chlorine is about 3.5, hydrogen is about 2.5. So there is a large difference between chlorine and hydrogen as far as electronegativity is concerned. And we learned that that means that chlorine is going to do what? Let's not go take. How about hog electrons, right? Technically, we're sharing, but we're not going to share real evenly. Okay? Now, let's talk about the cloud. The cloud that shows up in this picture, and your picture down at the bottom, right? is similar to a Schrodinger model of an atom. My goodness, we have to think back way back into like October for that. Yikes. So a Schrodinger model can be described or can be thought of as describing an atom in one word. Remember the word that goes along with Schrodinger model? An electron cloud is based on what? Nope, that's a Bohr model. An electron cloud is based on what? Orbitals. Mm, yeah, orbitals are based on what? Yeah, we're getting there. There's one word. No, what were you going to say before that? Electrons? Schrodinger models are based on probability. Does that sound familiar? Orbitals, orbitals don't tell us where electrons are, where they might be, or where they will probably or most likely be. Right? That sound familiar? Okay. So, the cloud around chlorine is larger than the cloud around hydrogen. Meaning, if we were going to look for electrons, where would we look first? Around chlorine. It has a bigger cloud than hydrogen. Why? Because this pair right here that they are sharing is not shared evenly. Oh, too much. Okay. Chlorine wants electrons more than hydrogen. While they share, they share unequally. And the pair of electrons spends more time around chlorine than it does around hydrogen. If electrons are spending more time by chlorine than they are by hydrogen, what's going to start happening over here on the right-hand side of that molecule? More electrons means it's going to be negative. Now, here's where we have to make a distinction. Anions become negative when they get electrons from somewhere else. We're talking something like that, but not to that extreme. Remember, these atoms are still sharing this pair, but not evenly. So, chlorine becomes visual, right? negative or negative-ish. 
where hydrogen becomes positive or positive-ish. Yes, but more stable doesn't necessarily mean even charge positive electron. It means eight valence electrons, right? That means it might be more stable as negative anion than it would be as positive cation, right? So here's my analogy to help you explain this, okay? So this situation where one side of the molecule is negative-ish and one side of the molecule is positive-ish is like drinking chocolate milk without shaking it up first. Okay. So, well, no, I'm thinking like if you buy like a if you buy like a carton of chocolate milk at lunch or something like that, okay? Or like a, or like a little jug of a true new or something like that. Okay? So, if you don't shake the chocolate milk beforehand or think about it this way, if you buy orange juice with pulp, okay, uh, no, 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 no. I am just saying, okay. Yeah, you do, yeah even, even orange juice, you know, if, even if it doesn't say extra pulp or whatever, right? If you don't shake it, what happens? All the pulp, or if we're talking about our chocolate milk, right? Where does the chocolatey stuff end up? The bottom. Now. If you don't shake up your chocolate milk, you know, Italian dressing is different, okay? Because, and here's why. So, just so we get, Eddie said, like Italian dressing, and I said, no, that's different, okay? And here's why. Because, even if you don't shake up the chocolate milk, if you drink the top, it's still chocolate milk, right? And if you drink the bottom, it's still chocolate milk, it's just not shared but it's not shared evenly. All right? They're both chocolate milk, but they're not quite the same chocolate milk. Okay? Whereas Italian dressing, right, is a complete separation of the vinegar and the oil. You know what I'm saying? That's what? That would be like what? That would be like, well, that, no, no, wait, wait, wait. That's why it happens, but in the terms of this analogy, Italian salad dressing would be like what kind of bonding? It would be like ionic bonding, because we have a completely different top and bottom. Chocolate milk is not completely different top and bottom. It's different, but it's still chocolate milk. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's what happens here, is that within this molecule, the right-hand side becomes negative-ish, or anion-ish. The left-hand side becomes positive-ish, or it's not a cation, but it's cation-ish, right? We sometimes represent that with this notation. Okay? It does look like a pair, and there's a reason why it looks like a pair, right? Because, right? So we're showing here that the right-hand side, that cloud's a little bigger than the left-hand side because the electrons spend more time on the right than they do on the left. Okay? Now let's talk about the symbols. So you got a negative and a positive, but there's something in front of it. Those symbols actually are Greek letters, or a Greek letter. It's actually a delta, but it's a, a lowercase delta. Q, capital Q and lowercase Q don't look anything alike. <laughs> so, wait. So let's talk about why. You've been, inter you guys have been, hey. You guys have been introduced to delta before, right? Delta means what? It means change. When we talk about ionic bonding, atoms completely change. They turn into being completely positive or completely negative, a cation or an anion. Are these things completely changing? 
they're not totally negative and they're not totally positive, but they are a little different. They kind of changed. And hence, lowercase delta, right? It's not quite a change, but we're on the way, okay? Now, what does that mean? Well, it means this, right? So if you're, wa if, you're watching, if you're watching the recording, you don't see this, but so I have a magnet, right? Okay, this magnet is all one piece, but the two sides of it are different, right? It's got a North Pole and it's got a South Pole. They're not completely separate from each other, but the two sides are definitely different. But that means that if I bring it close to another magnet, right? Even though the two sides are still part of the same magnets, we can make the two magnets stick together. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Flip to the second outline. Okay. I'm totally jumping in because I'm just trying to follow this point to conclusion. Second page. Roman numeral three. Letter C. I know. All right, so here's where we are, right? Second page. Second page. Roman numeral three, letter C. Compounds held together by polar covalent bonds, yes? Okay, let's talk about where we are here. Okay. Okay. We basically just wrote this down. Obviously, we just wrote it down so you guys kind of re hopefully remember it. Okay. Right? Some atoms have greater attraction for others than for than uh, greater attraction for electrons than other atoms due to their greater electronegativity. When these atoms form a covalent bond, the electrons are not shared equally. This is referred to as a polar covalent bond. I know, I know. <laughs> Some atoms have a greater attraction for electrons due to their greater electronegativity. When these atoms form a covalent bond, electrons will not be shared evenly. Okay, good there? And when that happens, we end up with something that looks like this. You have this picture down in the bottom left-hand side of your page, okay? This is a water molecule. The red represents the oxygen. The whites represent the hydrogen, right? H2O, okay? If you look at electronegativity values for oxygen and hydrogen, oxygen has a higher electronegativity than, uh, than hydrogen does. And that's why our hydrogens become positive-ish. And our oxygen becomes negative-ish. Okay? Yes, no, maybe? Okay. But what that then means is that if we have a positive part on one water molecule and a negative part on another water molecule, what will they do? They will attract each other. And that's why when you drop water on the table, it forms into what? 
forms into drops, right? <laughs> Although a bubble actually is kind of the same thing, Aaron. Right? <laughs> so, right? And then this continues to happen here, here, and here as well. And now we start having water, water molecules holding on to each other. Now, this isn't exactly a positive and negative, right? It's not a cation and an anion, but there is some attraction. When this is the case, we refer to these as dipole forces. Okay? Polar molecules are attracted to each other via the quote unquote negative end of one molecule being attracted to the quote unquote positive end of another molecule. It's not as strong as other kinds of forces, specifically ionic, and we'll talk about those tomorrow. But, right? These magnets attract each other because one side is a little negative and one side's positive. These meter sticks don't attract each other at all because it doesn't have any way to attract. Okay? We'll finish up that outline tomorrow and talk about how we get certain properties.